together again and seek your face and hear your word. Father, we ask that you would just bless us this morning. Send your Holy Spirit, O oh God, just to touch our hearts and our minds. Father God, hide me behind the cross. Don't let anything in me or about me get in the way of what you want to say and do. Father, this is your time and this is your hour. Well, let your Holy Spirit run down, rain down and have your way. Be glorified, be magnified. Bless your people this morning. In the name of Jesus, Lord, have your way this morning. Father, well, you are the potter, we are the clay, and here we sit, eagerly waiting your word and eagerly waiting your presence. We ask that you be glorified and that you be magnified. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all say amen. Amen. Church family, if you, there's a word from the Lord. If you have your Bibles, if you would open your Bibles to the book of Philippians, the book of Philippians, Philippians 4, Philippians 4 and 6, Philippians 4 and 6. And I'm going to read it from the New King James Version of the Bible. If you have it, if you would please stand for the reverence and reading of the Word of God. If you have it, say amen. If you don't, say wait for me. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to read it, and it reads thusly from the New King James. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Hang your hat on verse 6 really quickly. Be anxious for nothing. Before you take your seats, please shout my title to your neighbor. Say, neighbor. neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. You need to chill. You may be seated in the God's presence. You need to chill. This morning, when you come to church, there are many ways we can give sermons. Today, I want to land somewhere between a seminary lecture and a sermon for you. As I land between a seminary lecture and a sermon for you there, when we come to church, we construct sermons in various ways. You may hear something that has to do with doctrine to help encourage and lay the foundation for your faith. We all should learn a little bit about doctrine when you're in church. You should learn a little bit about soteriology. You should learn a little bit about once saved, always saved. You should learn a little bit about what is the doctrine of the Trinity. You should know a little bit of something about glossolalia. If you don't know those terms and know what they mean, seek past the gun after service. <laughs> you should get some doctrine while you're at church. But not only that, maybe, just maybe the sermon that you're listening to is going to be a little bit more inspirational. You should be reminded all the time that you can do all things through Christ that gives you strength. You should be reminded that God has called you to be the head and not the tail. You should get some doctrine. You should get some inspirational sermons. You should get some things that encourage your faith. But every now and then, you need to get a sermon that reminds you how to walk this Christian life. Every now and then, you need to be able to take the rudder of your ship, the instructions for life, your Bible, and be able to apply it to everyday life. I've told you once before that my goal, if I was pastoring and preaching, is to actually talk to the most intellectual people this side of Oklahoma City. That's why I love coming to Word First, because you're not only just a shouting church, you are a thinking church. You sit under a pastor that makes sure that you get into the Word, that makes sure that you dig into the Word, and that you just don't take what somebody else says for granted. Therefore, this morning, church family, as we look at this right here, I want to just talk to you a little bit about some things in life. As we talk about life lessons, 
I just want to focus this morning. Like I said, I don't want to have a traditional sermon. That's why you see no tie. I just wanted to relax and have a conversation and share from God's Word in my heart with you this morning. So, we're going to treat it like a seminary this morning. Anxiety. During this pandemic, over the last two years, we have seen our world get turned upside down and inside out. Our world, for all intents and purposes, will never be the same again. We all seem to run into those circumstances and situations, things that make us anxious, things that, that put us on the edge of our seat, things that seem to make us grit our teeth from time to time. When we look at everything that's happened over the last two years, this pandemic, these variations, one different variation, another different variation, should I get vaccinated, should I not get vaccinated? And if it ain't that, maybe it's just your own personal issues that give you apoplexy and anxiety. Anxiety. Things that make you just wonder and just worry about the future, worry about what tomorrow will bring. Think about it. During this pandemic, did you know that most medications for, for anxiety have increased over 31 percent in the last two years? Things that they're treating, diazepam, actually they use to treat anxiety has increased 31 percent. More people are getting diagnosed with anxiety like never before because this world our world has been turned upside down and if it ain't just the pandemic here it is you know you wonder about who's gonna get vaccinated who's not gonna get vaccinated me and anaya we went to the store and i hauled off and i sneezed over by some over in one section and the lady looked me up and down i had to say hey i'm vaccinated all right it's my allergies me and Anaya were on another aisle, and this dude, he sneezed right behind us. And as soon as he sneezed, my daughter took off. I said, why are you acting like that? She said, Daddy, a sneeze can travel up to 80 miles per hour. What you teaching them kids in school? It gives you anxiety over every little thing. And if that ain't enough for you, maybe the anxiety is because now we got to deal with kids. We had to deal with online schooling. That was enough to change us because now we have to be at home with our kids when they're doing online schooling. And if that wasn't enough, now they're going back to school. So are they safe to let them go back right now? Do I need to be concerned? Because everybody knows that if your little boo-boo catches COVID at the school and now they're at home, they not only have it, but you have it too because mama don't let baby take care of themselves. But not only that, now you have to deal with being even cooped up with family for two years. Somebody can look at your spouse and say, I married you for better or for worse, but I done contemplated killing you too. If you ain't never looked in the mirror and contemplated your alibi, you, you might not really be in love. Then you have to work from home, and now all the fear of going back to work. Is your coworker vaccinated? Are they, are, are they right? Or do I need to worry about this? You wash your hands. Everything seems to give us anxiety. Maybe your, your frustration ain't COVID-related. Maybe your issue is financial concerns. How am I going to get this paid for? Pastor, I got these student loans, and I got to take care of my wife. I got to take care of my daughter. She's trying out for club volleyball, and y'all know that's another 3000 Where am I going to get this money? If it ain't one thing, it's another. You look into the future worrying about tomorrow and how you going to make it, and that's enough to give you anxiety. We were to look at this situation with social concerns, the CDC regulations. Should we wear a mask? Should we get vaccinated? Should we get tested? And then when I get tested, I got to wait on the results? That's frustrating. You know what it's like to feel anxious. You know what it's like to deal and worry about your children. You know what it's like to worry about finances. You know what it's like to worry about your health. Have you ever went to the doctor and they gave you a bad diagnosis or the diagnosis that wasn't favorable in your, in, your, in your opinion and now you're worried about what's next for me and my family? You worry about that. You get frustrated. Everybody has some type of anxiety. 
But even in the midst of all that that you're worried about, all of that that you're frustrated about, and I know that some of us, we got this color of our skin, and we want to hold it back like, no, that don't never happen to me. We suppress it, we ignore it, we overlook it, but we still worry about things that are in tomorrow that haven't even shown up yet. And if you are not careful, it will beat on your soul. Paul has an answer. Paul notices that Christians will, are facing anxiety. Here it is. He writes in Philippians, and notice what he does. Paul writes. Come on back to the text with me. He writes to a group of Christians. Let me give you Paul's exigence. I'm sorry, exigence, his background on what's happening. See, this is what we talked about in Bible study. Come on on Bible study, Wednesday night, 630. His exigence here, he's writing to a group of Christians in about 52 A.D. While Paul is writing to a group of Christians in 52 A.D., he notices that they're going through some anxiety. They're going through some things that are uncertain in their lives. They're going through the worst moments. They are a new group of Christians, and they are going through their worst moments. How is it that he can even talk to the people in the household of faith? Haven't we always been taught that if you got God on your side, you'll be all right? But I want to be the first one to tell you that just because you are a Christian, just because you know Jesus Christ, you are not exempt from anxiety in your life. Paul is talking to Christians. Welcome to Word First Seminary. He's walking, he's, he's, he's talking to Christians almost 2,000 years ago, and they're dealing with the real issue of anxiety. And anxiety does not, is not racist. It, go, it transcends all genres, all races, all ages. Everybody can have some anxiety. I asked my daughter this morning, I said, Naya, give me an example of a time when you face anxiety. She said, Daddy, I don't have no anxiety. I said, well, Naya, what I mean by that is, give me an example of a time when you were looking into the future and you were worried in the right now. She said, that's easy. I want to know if I'm going to make my club volleyball team. They ain't called me yet. I'm worried about it. Matter of fact, I got on the team last year, and maybe, Daddy, they put me on the team, and I really wasn't as good as I thought I was because they were just letting everybody play on that team. So now she's worried. I'm not as good as I thought I was. She has anxiety. Am I going to make it? Will this work out in my favor? And over 2,000 years ago, Paul finds that these Christians that he's talking to in Philippi, this is a new church that he's established, and they're wrestling with anxiety. They're wrestling with anxiety because Paul is in prison right now. So they're wondering, what's going to happen to Paul? Is he going to get killed? Is he going to make it out of there? As a matter of fact, what's going to happen to us? They're looking into their tomorrow, and they're worried about something that ain't even came to pass yet. They're getting anxious. They're being persecuted on a daily basis. They're being persecuted by five distinct sources. Everybody, you can all have some anxiety. You can all have something that just makes you, while you're standing in the right now, you're looking at your not yet. It doesn't matter your title in the church. It doesn't matter the collar you got on. You can be pastor. You can be doctor. You can be elder. You can be bishop. You can be worship leader. You can be soloist. You can be chair this or chair that. But nobody is exempt from anxiety in your life. You can walk by faith and still have some anxiety. You can confess Jesus as Lord and still have some anxiety. You can memorize the whole Bible from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. That's the whole Bible, and you can still have some anxiety because nobody is exempt from it. So what is Paul talking about? Paul uses this word. He says, be anxious for nothing. This Greek word, anxious, Anxious is the Greek word merimnao, M-E-R-I-M-N-A-O. Say it with me, merimnao. Merimnao simply means to be fearful, to be worried, to be anxious, to be uncertain, to harp on something, 
And based on the Bible, the edition of the Bible you have, all of them translate it differently. So when you're looking at this word and you say, well, anxious, well, maybe that means eager. No, 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 no. That's not what Paul is talking about. Paul is saying they're in the right now, but they're looking at their not yet. And they're fearful, they're worried, and they're stressed. Have you ever been there? Do you know what that's like? To be fearful, to be worried, to be stressed out over tomorrow, something that's uncertain, something that ain't even come to pass yet, something that eat may not even be in your rear view or in your dashboard of life, but you are worried about it. And child of God, church family, brother man and sister girl, you can worry about something so much that it will make you sick to your stomach. Have you ever been so worried, so tore up from the flow of that you can't even get out of bed? Anxiety can just arrest your attention so much that you can't function. You can't say, hey, man, don't worry about it. I brought my own. There's a brother that's long gone on to be with the Lord. King. My little king in one of the biographies, here he is. He was going through so much anxiety and so much stress on his body. When they found him at the Lorraine Motel, he was sitting between those on that, on that balcony with his legs between that little, that, that banister. And it said that he was looking like he was bicycling. They pulled him off of that banister. They found in his coat pocket his crumbled up notes from the next Sunday sermon that said, why America may go to hell. But also when they were checking his pockets, they pulled out a pack of cigarettes. Jesse Jackson them said, and uh, Jesse Jackson them said, hey, we don't want to let America see his body like this, see him with the cigarettes, because we don't want him to think, think that, that we don't want them to think that he's a bad American. So Ralph Abernathy and them pulled those cigarettes out. But when you think about it, why wouldn't he smoke? Why wouldn't he have cigarettes in his pocket? Because every day he received a death threat. Every day he thought about somebody trying to snuff him out. Every day he was worried about losing his popularity. On the night that he gave that I have a dream speech before he even got there, he was laying in his hotel room in his bed with his head covered up. He had been stressing over the fact that people have been giving him reports that, Martin, your crowds are getting smaller. You're not as popular as you used to be. You're not as relevant as you used to be. So his conscience ran away with him. He began to worry about, is my life making an impact? One night sitting with his wife, Coretta, he asked her, he says, hey, after the Nobel Peace Prize, after all this thing I've done, will my life have mattered? He was worried about tomorrow. He laid in his bed and could barely get up. They would tell the story, Ralph Abernathy and Jesse Jackson, and they tell the story that when they're in a room and a door would slam, he would jump and shake because he didn't know if this is the time that somebody was going to try to kill him. People would walk by and he would catch a glimpse of shadows out the corner of his eye and he would have to get it together. He didn't know if this was the time somebody was going to try to kill him. We all deal with some anxiety. And our body responds. And that night that he was getting ready to go give that I have a dream speech, he's in his hotel room with his head covered up, contemplating, should I even go? Crowd ain't as big as we think. I done lost popularity. And he would have cold sweats. Can you identify Maybe your situation ain't like King's. Maybe your situation ain't because you were worried about somebody trying to snuff you out. But you know what it's like to worry about your family. If you've ever had a child that's been locked up, you worry about their health. If you ever had a child strung out on drugs, you wonder if they're going to make it out of this. If you've ever been in a situation where you're looking into your tomorrow while you're still in your right now, and you are consumed and fearful of the outcome. You get up every day, you go to work, you fake it till you make it. You do the best you can just to cope and just to get by. You walk in church with a nice suit on, some nice ties. You got your Mac makeup on. You look mighty, look mighty Baptist and mighty holy. But in the inside, you are tore up from the floor. 
you wrestle with anxiety. And anxiety is not just, not, all of us don't face it like that. Some of us face anxiety just here and now. You know, based on what's going on in our life, it comes and it goes. I can tell you the truth, anxiety ain't always negative. It ain't always bad. Because God has made us in such a way that we have to retreat to either fight or flight mode sometimes just so we can make it. That helps us preserve our lives. But the problem is not feeling anxiety. The problem is when you live there. When it controls you, when it consumes you, when that's all you know. When you wake up in the morning, you open your eyes and immediately you get worried about what if. Paul talks to Christians, reminds them that they are not exempt. He says, be anxious for nothing. They're worried, they're fearful, and they are being challenged and persecuted by five groups every day. Let's go to seminary. One group of people that they're, uh, that, that they're being challenged with, they're persecuted, is the Jews. They're being persecuted by the Jews. The Jews, this group, rejected the lordship of Jesus and the claim that Jesus was the Messiah, and they believed that the only way to right relationship with the Lord was through the Mosaic Covenant. So they persecuted the early church. The next group of people, other than the Jews, that, 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 uh, per, that, uh, the next people that, that just persecuted them were the Judaizers. The Judaizers and the Jews. The Judaizers were Jews who believed in Jesus, and they became Christians because they believed that in order for you to be a Christian, you had to first be a Jew. They believed and they held true to the Sabbath and the law of circumcision. So they believed in the law of Moses, they believed in Jesus, but they said that there's no room for the Gentiles. This is why Paul argued with them when him and Peter got into that riff in that tiff. But not only the Judaizers, so there's the Jews that they're dealing with, there's the Judaizers, and then there's the Libertines. The Libertines were those group of people, they believed that they were free from any form of moral law. They had no, their civil liberties, their liberties gave them the right to live any old way they wanted to live. And they persecuted the early church. The Libertines were those people that say, hey, I ain't got to get vaccinated, I ain't got to get a shot. I can infect whoever I wanted to infect, and for you to make me, it's a violation of my civil rights. The Libertines, the Judaizers, and the Jews. This next group of people that actually did it to them, that was actually, uh, that was actually persecuting them, were the Gnostics. The Gnostics believed that they were the spiritually and morally superior to anyone else. And if you didn't believe like they didn't believe, then you weren't saved. They persecuted the early church. But not only did they get it from the Gnostics, not only did they get it from the Libertines, not only did they get it from the Judaizers, and not only did they get it from the Jews, this last group was a group called pneumatics. Where we get the word pneuma or spirit or pneumonia. They got it from them, and these pneumatics, they believed that they were spiritually free, and they had already been set free and saved without Jesus Christ. So all these five groups, imagine that on a daily basis, you getting harassed, you getting persecuted, you don't know if you're going to get lynched today, you don't know if they're going to put them rocks in your life and stone you. So every day they go to work, they go to worship, and they worry, is this the day that they're going to stone me? Is this the day I'm going to be persecuted? Will we get killed today? As a matter of fact, where is Paul? When is he going to make bond? When are we going to put something on his books? When are we going to bail him out? What are we going to do? Are we going to get killed? Every day they're worried. They're looking into the tomorrow, and they're worried about what's going to happen. And they're looking at the worst case scenario. And Paul writes to them in the midst of their hell, in the midst of their frustration, Paul says, hey, be anxious for nothing. I know you don't know how this is going to turn out. I know you're worried about tomorrow. I know you're fearful. I know you're stressed out, but be anxious for nothing. And that's just not a word for the church early. That's a word for us this morning that Paul speaks from eternity past, and he speaks to you, and he says, hey, be anxious for nothing. 
I know you're going through it. I know you're worried about tomorrow. I know you don't want to know. You don't know how it's going to turn out. But be patient. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, with prayer and supplication, make your request known unto God. Have you ever received an on-time word? That's what these Philippians needed. They needed an on-time word. And Paul steps up right in the nick of time, and he gives them an on-time word. An on-time word to help them get through what they're going through. And have you ever come to word first, and you are going through your worst moments, and the pastor in the pulpit spoke an on-term word to your life? Oh, that's a good thing. A word that changes you, a word that's rhema, a word that moves in your situation. Paul is working with the definition of anxiety that is still relevant for us today. Anxiety at its very core, at its very best definition, anxiety is a very present stress caused by the fear of an unrealized future. Hear that. Anxiety is a very present stress caused by an unrealized future. You, 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 you're in the right now, the present, but you're focusing on the tomorrow. The tomorrow ain't certain, but I'm stressing over it right now. And we're worried about things that haven't even come to pass. Three big moments that happen when anxiety starts to take over. Anxiety begins when something happens in your life that causes you to wonder and worry about the future outcome. You're sitting in the right now, you're worried about the not yet. For many people, this happens just momentarily. You know what? I, I, my anxiety, my anxiety you know, it kicked in when Anaya was born. Here it is almost 15 years ago, next week. This doctor came in, and it's an average day like any other. Average day like any other. I go to work. My wife calls when I get to work, said, oh, my water broke. I think, this, I think she's coming. I rush home, go upstairs and get my daughter, go upstairs and get Tracy. We rush to the hospital and everything. Get to the hospital. I'm excited. I'm ready for her to come. I'm excited. That anxiety is set in because I just can't wait. And all along, this joker... Nine o'clock in the morning, took her time. And this joker didn't show up till 11 o'clock that night. By 10 o'clock, the doctor comes into the room with me and Tracy, and I wish she was here this morning. She comes into the room, he comes into the room with me and Tracy, and he says, we've seen and found some complications. The baby is in distress. The joyful anxiety has turned. Now the anxiety gets to worry, and I'm worried about what the future would look like. Tracy has a tear in her eye, so now I want to be strong for my wife. But anxiety has arrested me. All I could do is pray. Hold her hand and pray with her. The doctor gave us, well, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and we're going to get this baby here safely. But right now, she's been so active, and right now, the umbilical cord is around her neck, and the baby is in distress, but we got a solution. I prayed about it. I took that thing to the Lord. I, that's all I know to do. I, I just moved to Oklahoma City. Tony Evans is 300 miles away. Jonathan Nimmer, 300 miles away. My frat brothers are 300 miles away. My family, my support system are all way a long way away. Now it's just me and the God I serve. I pray about it. We go into that room 30 minutes later. I get this bouncing baby girl. God saw us through. Crisis averted. Looking into the future, thinking about, I was worried about, is she going to make it? God, the worst thing could happen. I'm already thinking that the baby is gone. I'm worried about the worst things. Three days after that, my anxiety has already been relieved, but the doctor comes in the room and she gives me a phrase that gives me anxiety all over again. The doctor looks at me and Tracy eyeball to eyeball, and I'll never forget it. And she said, you can take her home now. <laughs> From that day till this one, anxiety has set in. 
<laughs> anxiety happens. Anxiety happens when something happens in your right now that causes you to worry about your not yet. Put it like this. Think about a bell curve. See who's smarter than a fifth grader. When you think about a bell curve, on one hand of the bell curve, you have, an, you have both axes. One that is possible and another that is probable. Anxiety doesn't look at what's probable. Anxiety looks at what's possible. And anxiety tends to lean toward the possibility and ignore what's probable. So when we got this anxiety on this bell curve, it's all the way on the other end of the spectrum, but this is where our attention goes. So we look at the most, we look at the situation that is least possible, least probable, and mostly, well, least possible, but least, well, mostly probable, but we don't look at that. We look at the least possible situation. And that's where we focus our attention. It's like me with Naya. You know what? I just knew that she wasn't going to make it. I knew that this was going to be a bad situation. I knew that all hell was about to break loose. But we look at that, and I'm ignoring with him when he says, we got this. This is going to be okay. And that's what anxiety does. Anxiety forces you to look at the situation that's least possible and blow it up out of your control. You hide it. You don't talk to nobody about it sometimes, but your body responds to it. Your body responds to it. And child of God, my word to somebody this morning, it is not the will of God for you to have anxiety in your life like that. It is not the will of God for the anxiety to dominate your life. You've got to learn to deal with some anxiety. I know that it's not the will of God in your life, Here's how I know it's not the will of God in your life. The Bible teaches us, and we teach you in church and in seminary and theology, that Jesus is perfect and he never sinned. Come with me to the garden. When he's in the garden of Gethsemane, we've always taught that when Jesus was in the garden, that his sweat was like great drops of blood. And we say that he prayed so passionately that he started sweating. What if seminary conjecture. What if he's in the garden? He knows what's about to take place in the future, and his body is responding to an unrealized future. What if it was a cold sweat? What if his stomach was upset because he's worried about What's going to happen to him? He's about to get crucified. He's about to hang. He's about to be on that cross. And maybe, just maybe, his body is responding to that fear. Just maybe. But we don't teach it like that because we ignore the psychosomatic experiences that we all have. It's okay to feel the anxiety. You just can't live there. Notice what happens when Jesus is in the garden. If he is having a psychosomatic episode and experience and it's causing him a cold sweat and he is sweating, look at what he does. As while he's down there and he's talking to his father, is there any way to let this cup pass from me? God gives him an answer and immediately when he got the answer he needed, he walked the disciples up and said, hey, let's go do the dang on thing. I done prayed about it. I done talked to God about it. I'm energized. I'm ready. Let's go, Calvary. And maybe that's what we all need to do. When anxiety is beating you up, maybe you need to keep your eyes on the Father. Keep your eyes on the Son. He's answered your prayer. He's given you strength. He's given you power. Now you got to say, let's go do the dang on thing. This too shall pass. We know Jesus had trauma. But he didn't live there. He was young and he got separated from his mom and them. That's trauma. He went into the, into the synagogue in his hometown. They heard him preach and the Bible said that they decided they were going to try to throw him off of a cliff. That's trauma. He came to his own and they didn't receive him. That would be trauma. One of them in his clique, his club, and his crew betrayed him. That's trauma. Only to, get to the, only to get to the garden and have a cold sweat. Have you been there? Have you know what that's like? Having one of your BFFs betray you. Somebody you trusted in. 
Anxiety is a real fear. You begin to respond and react as if it's happening right now, even though you know it's not. When you have anxiety, you treat it like it's actually real in your life. Even though you know it's not happening and you know it's not real, but you act like it is. Anxiety focuses on the future. It picks out the negative worst moments, worst case scenario. It convinces you the only thing that you can do is it, the only thing that you can do is it let it happen. Anxiety causes you to respond as if it's happening even when you know it isn't. Anxiety can also, let me give you just really quickly here, let me give you four real quick and I can get out your way. Anxiety, the reason that anxiety is not the will of God in your life, because we know that it's not the will of God in your life, because if you don't deal with it, anxiety can quickly become a demon in your life. It's the difference between a demon and a spirit. Well, good preacher, what's the difference between a demon and a spirit? See, past the gun after church. What's the difference between a demon and a spirit? <laughs> a spirit wants to influence you. A demon wants to consume you and take over you. When your anxiety begins to just manifest and take over you, and that's all you think about, that's all you got, then all you have is you've let your anxiety become a demon because now all you see, all you do is think about that thing, harp on that thing, think about the worst case scenario. It has consumed you. And Jesus says, I can't let this demon occupy your life. Because every time in the Bible when Jesus encountered somebody that was demon-possessed, what did he do? He delivered them. Because he said, I refuse to let this thing take control of you. I refuse to let you stay in that situation you're in. You've got to come out of this situation because it is not the will of God for you to be consumed, for you to be occupied, for you to be taken over by something else like anxiety in your life. Anxiety can quickly become a demon if you don't deal with it. And the thing with demons, they come in packs. Remember Legion? Legion hauled off and told Jesus, he's Jesus, hey, what's your name? Jesus, my name is Legion because we are many. Legion is an allusion to a Roman guard that had anywhere between three to 6,000. Now, I don't believe there were 6,000 men, 6,000 demons in that one man, but it was enough. And the thing about it is that when one, kid, when one gets in, he holds the door open for another one. He holds the door open for another one. And before you know it, he's legion possessed. And here's the thing. If you don't deal with that, it's one thing for this anxiety. Now it opens the door to something else. You had anxiety, and now you got anger issues. You had anxiety, now you're beating on your spouse. You had anxiety, now you can't hold your job. You had anxiety, now you don't want to take care of your kids. You had anxiety, and now you got drunk. You had anxiety, and now you're drugged out. You had anxiety, and now you got this, you got that, you got that, and you got that, and you're wondering, how in the world did I get here? Number two, number one, anxiety can quickly become a demon. Number two, anxiety opens the door to sinful coping mechanisms. Anxiety opens the door to sinful coping mechanisms. How do you handle anxiety? What do you do when you have anxiety? How do you handle it when you got anxiety? So, Sister G, Sister G, check this out, because I know you're smart. Look at what the devil says that they, had, they need to do to handle anxiety. The devil says drugs. The devil says pornography. The devil says alcohol. The devil says anything that's going to keep from giving God glory. You know why you do other sinful things? Because when you're going through your worst moments with anxiety, you look for a way to alleviate your stress. You look for a way to medicate your pain. And you do it by inviting alcohol, drugs, sex, whatever it is to take your mind off of your hurt. That's what you begin to invite into your space. Fair question, Pastor. I'm so glad you said it. When you are hurting, have you ever seen somebody that smokes cigarettes? Have you ever seen somebody that they go through a traumatic experience and the next thing you know, you can see on my side, they just like this? What's wrong with you? Child, I'm just trying to calm my nerves. 
Ooh, and to echo what the pastor just said, how many of you got, watch this, Sister G, how many of you got friends and family that, that smoke weed? How many of you got, look around, look around the sanctuary. How many of you got friends and family? Me, I'm the only one. No, you got somebody? How many of you smoke marijuana? <laughs> Ain't nobody going to confess. But here's the deal, though. Think about this right here. What's the number one reason when you ask somebody why they smoking? Child, I just need to get this off my mind. I need to calm my nerves. I'm just trying to calm. I'm trying to medicate my pain. I'm trying to medicate my anxiety. I'm trying to get to a place where I can help me cope with this mess I got to deal with. Anxiety can quickly become a demon. Anxiety opens the door to other sinful coping mechanisms. But anxiety also threatens the abundant life that Christ died for you to have. Ooh, Pastor God, this is good. Anxiety threatens the abundant life that Christ died for you to have. Christ died so that you can have life and have it more abundantly. He says right here, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Make your request known to God and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. He came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. You can't have anxiety and have the peace of God at the same time. They are mutually exclusive. You're either going to choose one or the other. If you want abundant life, Jesus came that you might have life. And that's what we want to make sure that you get while you're at word. First, you need to understand that our God died for me so that I can have abundant life. Not just when I get to the pearly gates, but right here and right now. It ain't all about you getting material possessions, riches, fame, and fortune. Sometimes I just want to have joy. Sometimes I just want to have peace. Sometimes I just want to rest in the arms of a loving God. Abundant life is for me right here and right now. You will get a new roof. <laughs> Bible study shade, Bible study shade. You, 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 God has said, hey, he wants you to have abundant life. One of my pastor friends, he, he's, he, he's retired now. One of my old seminary professors, he retired. He got himself a Rolls Royce. Man, I was so excited for him because I've never been in a Rolls Royce. I, you know, I, hey, I ain't got it like that. I ain't got it like that. So, hey, he had himself a Rolls Royce. Man, I got to go talk to him and I got to sit in the car. I said, man, this is nice. Why would you, but, but I had to ask you, why, why did you pay so much for it? He said, let me tell you something. I don't think they sell these in heaven. And if I'm going to drive it, I'm going to drive this bad boy right now. There are some things that God want me to have right now. There are some things God want me to enjoy right now. I ain't telling you to go out and get you no Rolls Royce, but I am telling you that there is abundant life right here and right now for you. You've got to make your mind up that you want to have abundant life. There is something about resting in the peace of God. John says, John 3, John says, hey, that you may prosper as your soul prospers. That you may have that peace of God that transcends and surpasses all understanding. You know what it's like to lay down in peace of God? When you ain't, what, you know what? Murdoch. I love Brother Murdoch. That's my dude. That's my guy. Only because I love his beard. We, 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 we were in Bible study. Pastor Gunn says, hey, who ain't got what they really want and what they really need? What else are you seeking God for? What else are you waiting on God for? Brother Murdoch said, hey, I'm good. I'm at peace. I'm living my blessed life. Got my sweetheart. Life, love, I got that. Kids are grown. Like that, love that. Grandkids are grown, taken care of. Got that. I'm retired. God has been good to me. I don't need nothing else. I'm at peace. Well, what do you say to that? You know what Pastor God said? Amen. Well, what do you top that with? He's living his blessed life. Abundant life is here right now. 
And you've got to come to a term. You've got to come to a space and place where, matter of fact, what is your abundant life? What is it? What, what does success look like to you? No, 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 not, not the guns because they, they live in a blessed life too. They got it like that. Not the Murdochs. They got it like that. But what is your blessed life? What, what, what does it look like for you to be happy and be content? You may not have riches, wealth, fame, fortune, and money, but do you have peace? My peace I give to you. Do you have peace? Anxiety can quickly become a demon. Anxiety opens the doors to other sinful behavior. Anxiety threatens the abundant life for us to live in Christ. And the last one, and I'll be out your way and in my seat, anxiety is contrary to the peace of God. You cannot have, a, have peace with God and have anxiety. You've got to learn to make a choice. That God, there are some things that are out of my control. Maybe you do need medication on it. Maybe you do need to have a therapist, somebody you can talk to. But whatever you need to do, we've got to learn to acknowledge the, the, the anxiety that surrounds our lives. If you don't deal with it, it will deal with you. You've got to learn to wrestle and to deal with that anxiety because if you don't, then you'll open the door to something else. If you don't, you will never have the abundant life that God has called you to. If you don't, you will never have that peace of God that he's called you to. It's time to stop trying to act like we got it all together and sometimes come to the altar, reach out to your pastor and say, I'm tore up from the flow up. I need some help right now. I need to release this anxiety. I want that abundant life that Jesus has promised me. You will have abundant life right here and right now. As we look at it over the next few weeks, I'm sorry, I get to preach for y'all the next couple of weeks, Pastor said, okay? We look at abundant life and anxiety. May God bless you and may God keep you. Amen.